Good morning and welcome to another edition of Viewpoint on More Public Radio. I'm your host, Edric Osborne, and you can catch Viewpoint every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. at morepublicradiointernational.org. You can also catch us via podcast at edric.net. Uh, we're also posting now on SoundCloud. We're on Twitter at Viewpoint Radio, and uh, you can also look us up on Facebook. And uh, our previous guest, or last week we had a guest on, uh, retired Judge Lisa Perlman, and she's written a new book, The Sky's the Limit, People versus Newton, The Trial of the Century, where she goes in detail and in depth in uh, really making the case that the trial of Huey P. Newton back in 1968 could literally be called the trial of the century. And on this morning's program, we are pleased to have the foreman of the jury in that case, Mr. David Harper. And he joins us now to talk about that historic time and uh, just what he was going through during the time of the trial. So, Mr. Harper, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. Um, b before we get into the details of the trial and, and what was actually going on um, during the trial, let me ask you about your, uh, what you were doing, your occupation, and, and, and your background before you were selected to be on that trial. I was a uh, lending officer at Bank of America, San Francisco main office. So you were basically um, um, had a career. You were you were well established, and uh, but yeah. I, I guess you would consider you know someone who was was very successful. Yeah, I have uh, I had a bachelor's in accounting and an MBA from Golden Gate University, and uh, was in the, the largest uh, bank in the world's main office. Hmm. And prior to the trial itself, uh, during that time. Were you familiar at all with what the Panthers were doing in, in Oakland, and, and what was your what were your think your thoughts about what some of the things that they were that the Black Panthers were, were doing uh, well, at that time? Well, <laughs> I thought they were going to get killed. <laughs> <laughs> they were, you know, shooting out with the police and stuff like that. Uh, uh, very outspoken, and, uh, but they they uh, were angry uh, with the treatment of uh, of blacks. Uh, uh, in Oakland, anyway, and I guess in the world, and I guess a lot of blacks were, um, because we had riots in Detroit and Los Angeles and other places. So uh, uh, it was it was it was the times. Hmm. And, and and as someone who was involved in banking and just seeing it from from the outside, uh, you mentioned you thought they were going to get killed, but but were you aware of some of the response that was happening in terms of people who were just showing their outrage and 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 you know marching and things like that? Well, uh, you know, um, I don't, uh, well, you know, m marching happened way back, uh, I shouldn't say way back, but with Martin Luther King. Sure. Uh, and Memphis, uh, and, and, and Mississippi, uh, this was a continuous process. And it wasn't just with, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, one group, it was with uh, in almost the entire population. I guess the, the converse to the question about the Panthers is, um, you know, this case obviously involved the Oakland Police Department, and, you know, police departments had, were, were notorious at that time. Um, what was your view of, of the police in, in Oakland and Bay Area and, and some of the things that they were doing? Well, I, I think that the police uh, and the limited contact that I had um, was that uh, uh, they were not happy with the Panthers because the Panthers were, out of, in quotes, out of line. Uh, uh, they were arrogant towards the police, and uh, and the police, I think, were kind of tri trigger happy. You know, they they would see. Uh, you'd always read in the newspaper about someone that was walking down the street and they got shot, and and, and you would hear, well, he looked like a robbery suspect, you yeah. know, and and that would be the end of it. You know, you're just wondering whether or not the police just shot somebody walking down the street very similar to what just happened in Florida. Yes, with Trayvon Martin. It, right, you know, but that was not an uncommon thing in Oakland at the time, and it hasn't been uncommon since. <laughs> now, you, you obviously were seeing the, the, you know, the coverage on the news, and you probably had heard about the trial, and, and, or at least the arrest. 
Um, when did you get your jury summons, and, and did you have any idea that you would wind up being uh, on this jury? Well, I thought I was going to be on the jury when it first happened. And a uh, matter of fact, my son was going to the University of California, Berkeley. And I said, I've got a feeling I'm going to be involved in that trial. Mm. And, uh, and he said, wait a minute, uh, you're not on the panel, you, you know. And I said, no, but I think I might be on the trial. Mm. So March came, and I got a call to go down and take a test. I had to take a literary, literacy test. And I, and I t- t- reminded him. Remember what I said, <laughs> probably going to be on the trial. Well, the trial was set to, to go off in November, I mean, in, in um, May. And so he came back to me and said, Ah, oh, I see you're on the panel, but your panel doesn't start until June, so you won't be on the Newton trial. And so I said, Well, let's wait. We just have to see. So it was postponed to the last day of my service. <laughs> oh, wow. And I was 100 and. 70, like 176 person chosen for Bardier. And uh, so I sent, I sat through 170 of those. But I had the feeling all along that I was going to be involved in that trial. You, you mentioned the literacy test, and, and if, if I recall, one of the issues that um, actually came to light in terms of uh, uh, jurors and people being on juries that uh, the lawyers in the in the new trial actually um, brought a motion to not have jurors have to go through literacy tests, if I recall. And I think you may have been one of the last panels to actually have to go through that. Is that correct? I have no idea. I just heard about that. I think that that discussion was something that jurors didn't hear. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, because it was interesting that, you know, like you mentioned, you had to have a, uh, pass a literacy test in order to be on a, on a juror, right. jury. And that uh, actually was deemed to be uh, unconstitutional. Yeah, it was basic English, and uh, so it was not a problem for me. But I said there are some people that would be excluded because of culture. Exactly, exactly. Uh, let me get a quick reset here. This is Viewpoint on More Public Radio, and our guest this morning is Mr. David Harper, and he has the distinction of being the foreman on the jury of the trial of Huey P. Newton back in 1968. Um, and as Judge Lisa Perlman in her new book, The Sky's the Limit, People v. Newton, some have made the case that that was indeed the trial of the century. Um, so now you, you, you're going through the process. You get selected to be on the trial. Um, give us a little take of what the jury composition was like and, and how you actually became foreman of the jury. Well, you become foreman once the jury... The, the, uh, uh, trial goes to, to uh, is completed, and the, and the jurors select the foreman. Hmm. So you don't be, until the last four days, I was not foreman of the jury. I see, I see. And so once it once went into deliber- deliberations, the first duty was to elect the foreman. Hmm. So for four weeks during the trial, or six weeks during the trial, um, we had a chance to really look at each other and decide who was going to be the person that's going to be the four person. And um, uh, we had a, a fellow that was a, about 50 years old, with gray sideburns, dressed in a suit, white, and he looked like he was going to be the foreman. At day one, they would have selected him because he was the, in quotes, successful image of who should be foreman. Sure. We had uh, one young uh, uh, trust officer who was like in his late 20s. He was quiet. We had one oriental fellow uh, who took a lot of notes he was quiet uh we had a couple of uh, we had one young italian lady who took a lot of notes and but she was kind of uh, uh young i would say uh, we had an, an older italian lady who was, was very demure and then we had a, about four or five young ladies ladies in their 40s and uh, I think three of them were divorcees, and one had a job, which I describe as a baloney slicer. <laughs> and they were very outspoken. And uh, what they did was that they really had a lot of words to say uh, in the jury room. So they decided to start playing cards. They started to play um, spades. Well, I knew how to play that game, so I joined them. 
and I beat them regularly. <laughs> and but I was very nice about it. But I did let them know that I could take charge. Hmm. And so, based on on that, I uh, uh, became the leader. The other part was that I was black, hmm. only black on the jury, and everybody was kind of afraid. And I said, "Yeah, let's pick him." <laughs> <laughs> Him in the danger scene. <laughs> well, that that a good point because yeah. there, there some of the jury, there were some trepidation on people's behalf oh, yeah. about there being was, on this was, jury. There was an older older white lady that was a, a slim a slim lad lord that didn't know how not to to get on, hmm. and she did not want to be on. The other thing was that uh, I was teaching in the graduate school at the Golden Gate University, and the class I taught was organizational theory, and that was how do you become a leader? Right. How our leaders selected, and I was a quite a student of Chester Barnard, a book about leadership. So going into a situation, you you know you meet the the leader becomes the one that can meet the needs of the group, can get the work done. And I was demonstrating the fact all through the, the deliberations, not deliberations, but through the trial, that I could get the work done. Hmm. And that's how I became foreman. And. and- during the trial, what was that process like, sitting there every day? And I mean, did you, did people, I guess some people, but did you know the, the magnitude or the historic nature of this trial? I mean, sitting there and there's Huey Newton, who was this uh, burgeoning cultural icon in the making. Um, did, you, did you have a sense that this trial was going to be something completely different? And, and as you sat through the evidence and just the, the what was it like just being well, there in that well, atmosphere? Uh, the, the courthouse was surrounded by armed black men, uh, uh, black panthers. They were armed, and they had the whole courthouse surrounded every day, and they chanted. Uh, on the top of the buildings across the street was a National Guard with machine guns. The jurors came in under the garage, under a tunnel from the garage, up the elevator to avoid the crowd. I walked through the crowd. Hmm. And I got great respect. Uh, came up the elevator, and, and some big names were on the elevator. Uh, and I say big names, big names of that time. Sure. Were on the elevator, and I, I saw them and uh, didn't say anything to them. They didn't say anything to me, but they showed me great respect. But I wasn't about to be intimidated. I'd served in the military, and I said, look, unless we have justice, and that was my main thing. Unless we have justice in this country, uh, uh, we're all in trouble. I lived in the Oakland Hills. I'm black. The Oakland Hills are mostly white. Uh, and the lowlands, the flatlands in Oakland, was mostly black. I said, if there becomes a, a war, which it could very well be, been at the time, I'm going to be shot on my way down from the hills. And <laughs> <laughs> when I get down there, I won't be welcome. So what I said to, to people that asked me about, why didn't you get off that trial? Why are you getting on that trial? I said, because if I'm there, I can do something about it. I just don't want to leave it up to anybody for that, for justice not to happen. Hmm. And now, whether he's guilty or not, we've got to live by the rules of law. And people have to accept that and realize that that's what happened. So that was my mindset going in. That was my mindset throughout the trial and, it, and, and during the deliberations. Hmm. Uh, again, this is Viewpoint on World Public Radio, and I guess this morning is Mr. David Harper. He was the foreman of the jury in the People versus Huey Newton, uh, the trial in Alameda County in 1968, the uh, murder trial uh, of Huey Pete Newton. Um, some have written, and actually Judge Perlman wrote very uh, distinctly, that this was actually, in addition to being a murder trial of Huey P. Newton, it was actually, quote-unquote, the system was on trial. The American judicial system, the police department, just how African Americans were treated in general, that that actually was, uh, and even uh, uh, Huey Newton's lawyers uh, consciously made an effort to bring a lot of that into the case itself. A- as you were sitting there listening to the evidence, was, was that in your mind, or was it more, you know, I'm here just to focus on the evidence in this particular case with this particular defendant? I had a group of people who had a job to do, and that job could only be done by being honest with the evidence and honestly coming up with a 
scenario of what happened. And then they had to be honest with coming up with a verdict when they applied the law to that evidence. There was no way for anyone to manipulate that other than being honest. Mm. And some people didn't want to be that way. Some people wanted to say, and then he did the dirty deed, you know. Or some people wanted to say uh, that he was able to, in this, in this instant, go from a, from a very highly charged situation to where he could, could formulate the, the thought processes of first-degree murder. And so we had to examine that. Is that really the case? Was that really, was that really what happened? Would you have, with a reasonable person, would that would have happened in that situation? So we, 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 we did an academic type of analysis. We never had any yelling and shouting and screaming in the room. We sat back and said, okay, let's sit back and think about every little step in creating a scenario, then every little step in applying the law. Hmm. And that's what we did. Hmm. Now, historically, in my, in my mind, I knew that up until now, if you were black, a black male in this country and you were accused of killing a white person, you were going to die. Let alone a policeman, you were going to die. Mm -hmm. And so it was like an assumption of the community that Newton was going to die. And some people told me that if he's, if he's freed, I'm going to die. If, he, if, he, <laughs> if he's convicted, I'm going to die. And I got a note during the trial that said, do the right thing, we'll, and if you agree, we'll take your parents, your, your, kid, your family out of the country, any place you want, and you can get out right away, and, uh, and um, uh, I said, <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I'm not going to run. I'm going to do this. Look, this country won't be worth living in unless we can have justice. This is an opportunity to have justice, and 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 the community should be able to accept justice. Hmm. Well, the way it came down was the headlines in the Oakland Tribune said, in big big letters, Newton guilty. The black community is smart enough to know that manslaughter was a win, and so both sides were very well, not completely satisfied, but very well satisfied, and the thing died. Hmm. So that tension was just released um, with that trial. Hmm. And it set the precedent that we do have a black person, someone that's high profile, someone that's considered dangerous, um, that got justice. Hmm. And that's justice for blacks because he didn't automatically get, get hung. He wasn't going to be the, the, the mockingbird. Mm -hmm. And I believe even in um, there's there's literature out there where I believe even he uh, had put out a statement, basically saying that you know the verdict that came down actually um, saved his life in one respect because it was a it was manslaughter and not not the death chamber, but at right. the same time uh, acknowledging uh, his role in this the incident. Yeah, yeah, uh, well, no question about it. We knew it was clear that he got that he that he he shot the policeman. But he was the first one that got shot that night. Can mm -hmm. you hear me? I have a hard time. Yes, sir. Uh, but he was the first one that got shot. And, and, uh, and he got shot by a policeman who was just scared. And, and uh, standing in the dark. And the other policeman didn't know it. And that's why he turned around and he got hit. And then Newton thought the policeman that uh, had pushed him down when he got shot was the one that shot him and he was trying to defend himself. And the question is self-defense to manslaughter. Hmm. Uh, we have a couple minutes left with Mr. David Harper, who was a foreman in the uh, landmark trial of Huey P. Newton uh, back in 1968. And uh, uh, last couple questions I have for you is, um, you, you, you brought it forward again when we talked a little bit about Trayvon Martin earlier in the interview. Yeah, um, right. Do you, Having gone through that experience with the trial of Huey Newton and, and to today, you have a unique perspective on um, whether things are either better, the same. Uh, what, what's your take on the, on the situation today as we, as we sit here with the thoughts of Trayvon Martin? I think that Trayvon Martin is a martyr, that uh, it brings to light that, uh, uh, that black males are in danger, have been in danger. 
And I mean, when a young black man walks down the street, people become afraid because of stereotyping. And uh, here this young fellow died, didn't die in vain, should focus on the fact that black males, I mean, historically, have been in danger and uh, that there needs to be justice in this case. And my last question is, um, now that, that once the trial was over, and, and what's life been like for you since then? Oh, fine. Nothing. No repercussions. Uh, the day after the trial, it was just like nothing ever happened. Hmm. I mean, today in a trial like that, the, the four person would be out on, on CNN and book well, contracts. And <laughs> Did you have well, any we, of that kind of thing? An agreement. We made an agreement that we would not talk. Hmm. We said, look, look, we're not going to talk about this trial. And, uh, and then all the tension will die because we're not going to have it carried on and on and on. Um, and uh, I think one or two pe people spoke at that time. I think after 40 years, it's okay to say something. Well, sir, we definitely appreciate you taking the time to speak with us about this uh, just remarkable role you played in, in not only in the history of, of the trial in Oakland history and, and the history of California and Bay Area, but, um, again, I, I truly believe, as Judge Perlman has written, that this trial um, definitely is up there with one of the trials of the 20th century. And, uh, again, I want to thank you so much for your courage and for your, the example you set uh, in, in seeking justice and, and truth and, and literally uh, upholding the system to try to ensure that it works for everybody. Thank you. All right. This is Viewpoint on More Public Radio. Our guest has been David Harper foreman of the jury of the trial of Huey Newton. And again, we thank him so much for speaking with us here today. Thanks again, Mr. Harper. Uh -huh. All right, it's Viewpoint on More Public Radio. I'm your host, Edric Osborne, and we'll be right back right after this. Mm -hmm.